sitting proudly on the shores of Strangford Loch is Mount Stuart, a jewel in the National Trust's crown and in desperate need of repair. Because obviously this is heavily rotted at this end. For the past three years, we've had unprecedented access as the National Trust in Northern Ireland has undertaken its most ambitious restoration project ever, going to extraordinary lengths to conserve not only the building itself, but its contents, including some of the rarest and most expensive works of art on this island. And all of this while keeping the doors open to the public. This is restoration on a massive scale, but equally huge are the headaches it brings. We dreamed of it going in at a, at a nice fast rate, but it's, uh, it's not to be. And it's problems like these that threaten to knock the whole project off schedule. We had lots of grand visions about how the project was going to actually look. Those grand visions haven't necessarily just come to fruition as we would have wanted. And with a wedding due to take place here in just a matter of months, the pressure is really on. It's been just over 12 months since the contractors arrived on site at Mount Stuart. And the graceful open spaces that are so characteristic of this grand mansion house have now all but disappeared, only to be replaced by the noise and paraphernalia of a building site. As ever, David and his team of project joiners are constantly on the go. At some point in the house's history, these shutters were modified, but not necessarily for the better. So they'll be taken to the National Trust's on-site workshop, where they'll be sympathetically restored. But for everyone here, one of the more unusual challenges is just ahead of them. These giant antlers that hang in the private quarters of Lady Rose were believed to have been dug up from a bog in the estate here at Mount Stuart during the 1800s. Although they're often referred to as Irish elk, these antlers actually belonged to a now extinct species of giant deer that would have roamed throughout Ireland around 10,000 years ago. So as well as being very big and very heavy, these antlers are also the oldest thing in the house and therefore very, very fragile. And today, they have to come down. Right. The general idea is to take the material lift to support the weight of this. Removals expert uh, Colin Finlay takes board. time to ensure that the team approaches this lift with near surgical precision. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Having been on the wall for a while, the antlers require some gentle persuasion and everyone breathes deeply, hoping that Trevor is a good aim with his hammer. Not yet. It looks good. Slowly and very tentatively, they start to come away from the wall. Yep, that's us. But still, each creaking sound sets everyone on edge. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. With the antlers safely off the wall, Colin can secure them to a wooden base while the rest of the team catch their breath. Albeit momentarily, as they still have to get this fragile cargo to ground level and then safely out through the doors. Oh, okay, four knots. Yeah. The combination of the scaffolding in the central hall and the awkward shape of the antlers 
is turning this part of the move into a complex three-dimensional puzzle. And the team soon have to admit defeat. As Colin's internal satnav recalculates the route, you still, you've got twice that to go around that. It soon becomes clear to David that they've only got one option. Trevor! Yeah. You don't. But it's not a decision taken lightly, as the door in question is over eight feet tall and made out of solid mahogany. I definitely don't want the door to drop. Easy. Okay. Job done. Okay. This momentary pause does at least give Lady Rose a chance to get a closer look at her old friend. <laughs> Then, finally, two hours after they started, this beloved member of the family makes its way out into the hallway and safely onto its top bunk. Well, I'm happy now it's on the shelf, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a bit nerve-wracking. Job done. Now, they only have one more to go. It's the small things, like having to move 10,000-year-old antlers, that can take up so much time on a project like this. But even on a tight schedule, the complex demands of the big house can't be rushed. For the conservation engineers especially, thinking time is vital. John Avent and Tom Hill have been busy dreaming up unique solutions to these challenges, designing them from scratch to work seamlessly with this historic building. After months of tests, trials and redesigns, the latest version of their system to strengthen the upstairs floors is looking hopeful, if rather unusual. This one's going to work and um, certainly the data we're getting back is showing that the, the tension is staying in the system and the idea is that this agricultural prototype will be uh, streamlined into a more practical, slimmer steel system and be moved from room to room. We did kid a few people that uh, it, was, it was going to stay and they'd have to work around it, but uh, they were having none of it. But John's agricultural prototype isn't the only thing taking the strain right now. With so many elements in the project facing delays, it's inevitable that something's got to give. Oh, we're behind, of course. Um, as, as with all things, uh, as soon as we started the actual program, we slipped behind in a number of areas. We had lots of grand visions about how the project was going to actually look. Those grand visions haven't necessarily just come to fruition as we would have wanted. There are very few projects that uh, will dwarf this one in terms of scale, or, and certainly not in terms of complexity. And I think that we have multiplied that complexity by actually having the building open throughout. The original project that we went to the Board of Trustees with was for a 5.89 million pound investment in this house. Um, we very quickly came to realise actually that 5.9 million wasn't going to really do it. Um, so we went back to the Board of Trustees and expanded that budget to 7.1 million pounds, which is what this project is now going to cost. It's the largest investment the Trust has ever made in Northern Ireland and uh, it shows the significance of this house and this family and this collection. And it's easy to see how those costs keep spiralling upwards. To repair these fractures, the contractors need to install anchors into the walls, but they're having to rethink their approach to avoid damaging this rare hand-printed wallpaper. This is a small-scale sort of demonstration model of the sort of item that we'll be putting in, but what we'll be putting in is a, is a five metre long uh, stainless steel bar which has a, has a gauze sock around it and a grout is injected into the, into the end of the anchor which inflates the sock and this is a small scale model of an inflated sock. It takes up all the undulations, all the irregularities in the core of the wall and where it passes across the crack the, the sock helps to tie and link the two ends of the wall across that fracture. To do this they need to drill deep into the walls. However, the water they use to keep the drill bit cool could damage the delicate paper. So while Fiona works on protecting it as much as possible from the inside, the contractors set up their drill outside, substituting the water with compressed air. As an added precaution, they start by drilling into the adjoining room, 
which also requires attention, but is at least wallpaper free. But it soon becomes clear that compressed air alone is proving no match for the tough grey wacky stone that faces the wall. We always knew that the, the grey wacky was a very, very hard stone and uh, it was going to be slow drilling and that's exactly what we found and um, it's persevering, which was, uh, which was always the plan. But for all their perseverance, it's the grey wacky stone that's definitely winning. And so it's a job that will have to wait for another day. For the contractors, it's a frustrating wait. Although there's plenty to be getting on with in the meantime. But when a fire alarm sounds, it's all tools down and everyone out of the building. And as the fire brigade pulls up, the staff can only look on nervously, everyone fearing the worst. But to their obvious relief, it's simply a false alarm. It's still an unsettling experience though, a sharp reminder of just how vulnerable our built heritage really is. The project team here at Mount Stewart have been struggling to keep this massive restoration project on schedule. The conflict of trying to protect the delicate fabric of the building while carrying out major physical repairs has resulted in delay after delay. To add to their woes, they've uncovered more asbestos throughout the house than they were anticipating. As with any old house, uh, when you start taking up the floors and knocking through sort of uh, bits of structure that have been there for a hundred years, you find lots of unexpected things, and we have found lots of unexpected things. Um, we've discovered a lot more asbestos than our original surveys indicated, but we are forging ahead and we've been very careful actually in making sure its removal has been well managed. But until all the asbestos has been removed, other work in the parts of the house affected had to stop, which has set them even further behind schedule. So now, it's full steam ahead. Over in the rooms Versailles and Verdun, a compromise has been reached, allowing the contractors to use water as they cut through the hard, grey wacky stone that defeated them on their last attempt. If they can get through that, then they can start using compressed air as they drill deeper. It seems that at last, they're making progress. Then, from inside the house, radios crackle with a call for the drilling to stop. Dust has started seeping in through the protection, and before long, the room is a hive of activity. We're just calling the joiners in just to give us a bit of a hand. We've asked them to stop drilling for now so that we can put a little bit more dust protection in. So we want to seal this door so it's not going to go into the side. The minute they change to using the compressed air, then it's just they were just saying that the dust can travel through maybe a pin prick. So it's finding its way in any somewhere. Elsewhere in the house, the engineers, along with the contractors, have started work on strengthening the gallery floor. All the work has to be completed before the scaffolding can be removed and the central hall cleared. It only takes a little sunshine for the big house to feel all continental. And it's the appropriately named Italian gardens that are being given a new lease of life. It's all part of the ongoing effort to maintain the 100 acres of gardens and woodland that make up the estate. It was Lady Rose's grandmother, Edith Lady Londonderry, who handed the grounds of the estate over to the National Trust in the 1950s. Since that time, thousands of visitors have been able to explore this beautifully maintained space. One area, however, remains private to the Stuart family. On its elevated site, overlooking the rest of the gardens, sits Tirna Nog. Well, Tirna Nog is a family burial ground made by my grandmother for the family. And it means land of the ever young. And it's got a wonderful view over the garden. And she had all these statues made. It was all her sort of idea. The first two were my grandfather was buried here, and then my grandmother, and they have very ornate carved stones with all their favorite things on them. My grandfather, you know, everything to do with flying, 
um, him playing cards, all sorts of things. And my grandmother with her parrots and her, her dogs and her garden. When my grandmother died, the little um, cockatoo was distraught, so it plucked all its feathers out. So you had this oven-ready bird with a, a crest. And the funny, when I, when I first brought my husband to Mount Stewart, we were all so used to it, we'd forgotten it looked like that, and I think he practically fainted. You know, suddenly walking to the house the first time, and it was in the central hall in its aviary, there was this blue skin with a beak and this huge crest. <laughs> This is my mother, who's the most recent. And we designed that stone, so it's got the Stuart drag in this end, looking duly fierce, because he has to protect the family. And then it says, beloved daughter of Charles and Edith London, because she was the favorite daughter. And then that side, it says, devoted to Mount Stuart, which she was. I wanted her to be bigger than her sisters, <laughs> but smaller than her grandparents and a different coloured stone, so it's a pinkish stone. The love of her life was breeding her racehorses, so it's a pinkish stone for that reason, and I think it's actually very pretty. You know, often we come up here and just sit and, you know, you relax your mind, and it's very soothing to the soul up here. And I know that those who have gone before us are resting in peace and they're in a happy place. Everywhere you look in Mount Stuart, whether out in the gardens or inside the house, there are little touches that can only cause you to smile. Idiosyncrasies that reflect the personalities of the Stuart family and give a glimpse into their lives. One rather quirky feature of the house is the naming of the bedrooms. It was the third Marquess of Londonderry and his wife Frances Anne who named each of the rooms after cities they visited, creating a unique memento of their travels abroad. But the rooms that lie behind some of these doors have undergone a complete transformation. Named after the capital of Sicily, the bedroom christened Palermo has become a busy conservation store, while next door Hig is now a fully kitted out conservation workshop. The conservation studio has been constructed so that we could, through the project, have conservation work going on in the house that people could come and see. It's got good daylight lighting, it's got lots of electrical sockets, it's got tables that come up and down and are very stable, it's got all the lovely things you need, but it's also very practical and very simple. And it's part of our, I suppose, legacy as part of this project is to have this fantastic studio that is available now, so it's a great, great asset. And currently making good use of this space is paper conservator Graham Storey. I'm here working on these paper lampshades. They are all paper shells, but very vulnerable. And, and they're, they're really quite large things, but in a room, with people just moving around the room, they, they inevitably get damaged, so there's a lot of the, the Paper shades here have got holes in them, they've got splits, they've got tears, they've got missing pieces. In paper conservation, a normal repair would go in from, from the, the back of a paper sheet and then, if necessary, filled on the front. But those objects would then be seen just in ordinary room light or daylight. They wouldn't be seen in transmitted light. And the problem with these is that, that these are going to be exhibited with a, a lamp lit behind them. And so what I want to do is to get the, the, the repairs to look good with the light behind them, but also not to stand out when the lamp switched off. This has been a trying few months for the project team here at Mount Stewart, but their steely determination means that they are at least likely to hit one target. With the central hall looking remarkably like its old self again, work begins on preparing the house for this one day of magic. Getting it to this stage is a huge relief for everyone, not least the groom, Andy Kelly. Looks good. 
and wedding coordinator Jan Hollinger can at last focus on the day's finer touches. And as the guests start to arrive, Lady Rose and her husband Peter make an unexpected appearance, helping to calm any last-minute jitters. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. you found it. it. Surviving. Very elegant. Mostly oblivious to all the work that has gone on behind the scenes, the guests sit and enjoy the opulence of their surroundings as they wait patiently for the star of the show, who Jan just appears to have found. For Nicola Green, getting married in Mount Stewart has been a dream since childhood. With the immense efforts of the project team and the contractors, what seemed like an impossibility only a matter of weeks ago is now a reality. In the end, all that matters now is the next 30 minutes. But there are big emotions in the big house on the big day. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Nicola. Take you, Andrew. Take you, Andrew. To be my wedded husband. <laughs> to be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. And I promise Everyone you. holds their breath, silently willing her on. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. <laughs> for richer. <laughs> for, <laughs> for richer. <laughs> but nothing breaks the tension like a bit of laughter. And with the exchanging of rings, the celebrations can soon get underway. If only they could remember the way out. It's been a wonderful wedding to finish on and it's fantastic that the weather has held out for us, it's always a worry. You can't really fault it, it's been a great day and everyone has relaxed and enjoyed themselves which is what it's all about. For this brief moment in time, it could be easy to forget about all the hard graft that has gone on in this place over the last 16 months. Not to mention the two years of work that still lie ahead.